Um, so I'm Julie Sapp and Danielle. Um, we are going to uh, spend a little bit of time talking about um, some work that we actually collaborated on together. Um, so I'll start off and kind of set the stage and then Danielle will jump in and um, uh, talk more about our results and our findings. So. Um, we uh, conducted this study of uh, trying to understand the attitudes and the underlying values and beliefs of parents who are undergoing exome sequencing um, because their children are undiagnosed. And when we, when we started the study in 2011, this was a relatively new idea. I understand this is much more common now. Um, so uh, all of our participants came from a research protocol here at the NIH um, called Whole Genome Medical Sequencing for Gene Discovery. And the, the two broad goals of the protocol were, of course, to determine the underlying genetic uh, etiology for rare disorders. Um, and then we also had some social and behavioral goals um, of this project that are ongoing uh, to develop best practice approaches for the return of results to our participants. And so that's what we're going to focus on today. Um, so uh, I wonder if this, I'm just going to take a bet that um, this will not be the last time the theory of reasoned action is invoked or mentioned <laughs> at some point. Um, so uh, our goal is really to understand um, our participants' uh, values and beliefs that underlie or that uh, build upon their attitudes about what kind of choices they make about receipt of genetic testing results, exome sequencing results um, uh, for their children. So um, uh, again, the participants in this protocol are parents who are making decisions on their child's behalf. Um, and our main questions were whether or not um, parents' attitudes and what par to assess parents' attitudes and preferences about a variety of um, uh, uh, categories of results and see whether or not their attitudes are stable or change over time. And then um, what's currently ongoing right now is uh, trying to develop an understanding of how our participants, how our parents are using these results after they've been returned. So we'll focus mostly on the first part of, um, uh, again, our ongoing social and behavioral research projects that are associated with this protocol. So. Um, Oh, actually, I think that's when I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah, exactly. Right. Very good. Is this the pointer? Can I do this? Ooh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can. All right. So um, our – let's switch places. Oh, sorry. There we go. Um, our research was a qualitative study for this first part. So we had uh, 25 parents of 13 minor participants who uh, were interviewed prior to consent. And I think that that's an important part about what we're going to talk about um, in our uh, talk today because the, it was specifically designed so that our participants and the people that were interviewed were a bit naive to what they were going to get into. So this was really, we were, trying, we were doing a pre-test conversation, then the participants came to the NIH and the full consent happened and then testing and then post-testing interviews were after. But again, it was a structured interview that we went through um, and the two main highlights of what we talked about were we went through what the sequencing technology was, what is whole genome sequencing, why is your child um, going to have it? Why are you going to have it as a part of our protocol? And then um, what was their interest in receiving four different categories of specific results that you could get? So again, the primary variant being the reason why that that child was there. That child had an undiagnosed, uh, a condition with an unknown genetic etiology. They could receive the primary variant as uh, one of the results. And then the three others that we have up here were they could receive secondary variants for disorders that were actionable in childhood, something they could do something about. And the result, um, the example that we used in the interviews was something like FAP, something you could actually um, treat in childhood. The third category were the variants for disorders that are not actionable in childhood, um, something like uh, Alzheimer's or um, an adult onset cancer. Um, and then we had, actually I'm really just not up there, carrier mm -hmm. status. We had carrier status for a number of uh, autosomal recessive disorders for which the example was talking about cystic fibrosis. Um, and then we had variants of uncertain clinical significance. Um, and we're not really going to talk about very much about this today. This is a part of our ongoing research and I actually think is um, something we just wanted to highlight here because it was of something that emerged during the interviews that we were doing. So it was something we added in during the um, interview process and I think shows how important it is that you're learning in this qualitative um, study and then adding in things that where you might find something interesting later on. So we really like that part of this. Um, so here is one of our punchlines at the end of what came out of the research is that really parents' attitudes vary. Um, and it, it was across the range of actionability and what can happen with those results. Um, for the first two that we have over here on um, the side, the primary variants, again, the reason the genetic etiology for that child's um, underlying condition, uniformly all 25 uh, parents wanted to learn about. Did not 
a surprise because that was one of the goals of the research. Um, and then secondly, also the treatable or preventable in childhood um, secondary variants. That was something that all 25 parents wanted to learn about. And what we'll talk a little bit more that was really interesting were the carrier status and then what was any um, variants for not treatable or preventable in childhood conditions. So um, we have two slides about these two. So the variants of um, of the uh, genetic variants that were not actionable in childhood. We had a pretty broad range, and I th we thought this was one of the most interesting things that came out of the research. Um, we had 10 um, participants who absolutely wanted to learn these variants. Um, we had three conditional yeses. We had six parents that had, or six answers that were ambivalent and six no's. These do not add up to 25 because parents can hold more than one of these attitudes at the same time. So we had reasons across, um, across the board. Um, and that I think is again a, a really important finding of all of this. The, the two that were again, so of the positive yeses, um, is going over that there were genetic variants that are um, that you cannot do anything about in childhood and 10 of the parents said but there are still things that can be done and measures that can be taken so that this shows that the parents perception of what this what the genetic variant was was it was something useful it was useful to them and wanting to know that they could do something about it um, and then secondly, that the parents also, the ones that answered positively yes, they'd want to know about these variants, is that they could keep abreast of the research, they could curate the literature and understand better than not knowing, um, better than just a researcher having that information. So these were really important attitudes of why that parent wanted to know, um, and again, was that one of the beliefs that they had that underlied why they wanted to know about this um, information. Um, the conditional yeses, again, also the parents wanted to know, but they wanted to wait until the proband um, was an appropriate age. They really wanted to know the information, but we we're going to wait at some point to know that so they could discuss it with their child. And then the neutral ambivalent, they were really unsure during that interview process whether they wanted this information. And then um, there were four, absolutely not, I do not want to know that. So for the carrier variants, again, so um, this took away the no category. So there were 13 absolutely yes, I'd want to know any carrier variants. And then a conditional, five conditional yeses and seven ambivalents. So again, this was a little more skewed toward wanting to know the information where we had no absolutely positive no's here. Um, so again, parents want to know their children's results along this continuum of actionability. And these five, um, beliefs underneath were again some of the foundations of why these parents were making these decisions that were really interesting that came out of this so parents having want some responsibility they wanted some control and wanted control over those results as well as having a preference for knowledge again these are uh, i think important themes and that sometimes that they they wanted them because of, of faith-based decision uh, faith-based beliefs and altruistic beliefs as well so <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> um, so, uh, where we are right now is that this is um, this component of our protocol is um, of our of our study is complete, um, but we're still interviewing parents in an, in an ongoing fashion. Um, so we're continuing to return results um, and we validate any primary variants. And then, um, uh, so Danielle interviewed all of these people immediately before they consented, um, and then she's interviewing them again at the time that we have results available. So um, we call them, we let them know that we have results available, and then they complete an, an, another structured interview where we're making it a little bit more concrete and they're declaring their actual results preferences that we'll use uh, in returning results to folks. Um, so even though people have some nuanced opinions so far, um, I haven't had anybody say anything other than if you know anything you can possibly tell me, um, including this idea of variants of uncertain clinical significance, which is something that we introduced kind of halfway through the process because people were, were, were asking about this kind of after the consent process. Um, and so uh, uh, that the, those interviews are in progress, and then we also interview participants again six months after the return of results. Um, and uh, um, I, again, this is just anecdotal data, um, but uh, the findings of, of those, um, we've done eight of those interviews, and so far people have absolutely no recollection of anything that we've told them other than the primary variant. Um, we haven't delivered any particularly, um, I would call them high impact variants to people, but um, I think one of the participants that you most recently interviewed said, did I even get results for myself? Did we even talk about anything else other than the cause for my child's condition? So, um, so far, 
people are not really remembering those conversations very well and they're not utilizing uh, this information and they're not disseminating it throughout the family. So we'll just see um, how that goes. Um, and then another kind of uh, corollary project that's going on right now, again, emerged from uh, Danielle's initial interviews um, where we're specifically focusing on um, the rationale that parents bring to the table when they're thinking about whether or not they want variants of uncertain clinical significance. And again, the idea that we're in this protocol, it's structured in such a way that they are actually getting choices so that they can make um, decisions and they can distinguish between different categories of results that they want to receive. Um, so that's also something that's going on. Um, those interviews are conducted by um, my research assistant. So, um, and actually, Sam, you're, you know, you're, you, you know the data <laughs> much better than I do. <laughs> um, so we'll have something to report about that sometime soon. So we, of course, like to thank all of our participants and the people that we work with, um, the research assistants who um, coded the data, the people who supervised the research assistants who coded the data, and that's us in 2005. <laughs> 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 We're doing questions at the end collectively, right? So we no, should we move. Have time for, I, I have a question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so do you think that, I mean, it's fascinating that um, the, the information um, is not hanging with people and that it, it, it we, we're much more Mm -hmm. I happen to know that's true in some of the other studies as well. So um, in your particular cohort, um, in what ways do you think that that response may be related to years of living with a child going through multiple tests and not mm -hmm. really getting anywhere as a result mm -hmm. of, of all of those? Mm -hmm. Did everybody hear context, Barb's question? The context. You, yeah. it, you want me to repeat it again? Yeah. For, okay, so I think Barb's question was, um, in our cohort, this, this idea of um, what sticks with people, how much of that is related to the, the fact that they have been on this long diagnostic odyssey, I think it's absolutely related. I think they have their eye on this very particular prize, and everything else is secondary until it's not. Right, so we, like I said, we haven't delivered anything else that would require any sort of actionability thus far. Um, uh, with one exception that it hasn't been six months yet, so you haven't interviewed them. So we'll, you know, so we'll see. I, but I think I think it's absolutely related. Do you want to? Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. And again, just thinking back to the anecdote, the, the actual interviews that was, I would give the um, participants a chance to talk at the beginning, just tell me, and every one of them started with, "Here's my child. This is what we've been through. This is the testing I've had. You're going to help me." So that I think that was the start of the conversation, and it continues through. Absolutely. We're gonna have to remember that. Yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> I'm not really good at restating questions. <laughs> I'm not sure if I missed this, but I guess I'm just surprised that none of the parents said that they didn't want to know the results because they didn't want to take away their child's autonomy and like their decision to want that information. So that was um, that was actually a rationale for um, underlying positive values about receiving information. Um, not more people talked about, I'd like the information, but I will, I will hold on to it, I will keep it, I will curate it, and then I will share it with my child at the appropriate time. Um, then they talked about wanting to preserve their, their child's autonomy. We, I think we did have one or two people say that, but it, it didn't make it into kind of our major themes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. Yeah.